Question. What are you a fan of? Is it a movie? A book? A TV show? A music group? A sports team? Or maybe something less conventional? I'm Reagan. And I'm Christian. We've spent over 10 years working in the customer service and entertainment industries. It's this experience which leads us to believe that everyone has a compelling, personal connection to the things that they are a fan of. And we're here to uncover the secret fandoms of the Gulf Coast's VIPs. Join us as we talk with passionate fans about what they love. On this episode of Fantastic People, some will be, he'll use traditional Chinese instruments. They're just cool mm-hmm. to listen to. And they're, they're by no means like head boppers. <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to find them at any party. I use that because they also have a really, most of them have a really good beat. And there was a time in my life where I just needed to do a lot of running just to work out my emotions from stuff with my parents and stuff with my own personal life, identity crisis, mm-hmm. not really midlife, but like pre-midlife and so I did a lot of running and those songs just as someone who doesn't listen to music I usually when I am running I usually run in silence but those really helped me Mm. just find my footing in more ways than one we are joined with Alex Gartner Alex is the artistic and executive director of the Pensacola Children's Chorus a local youth and children's chorus that is a non-profit community-based youth arts education program in northwest Florida while Alex's career requires him to be connected to music nearly 24-7, he is specifically a fan of world music and finds that it helps him enjoy his passion while also disconnecting from his daily work with music. This episode of Fantastic People is sponsored by Hellcat Hangar in Pensacola, Florida. Hellcat Hangar's venture is to build a thriving network of individuals and opportunities centered around the production arts and media. They strive to provide exceptional service as a production studio, valuable insight and education, and to enrich the overall industry across the Gulf Coast. They open their doors as a business, a venue, and as a community event center, but in all manners, their doors are open to cultivate a culture of togetherness. To join the Hellcat Hangar community or reserve a time for your event, you can find them online at hellcathanger.com or call 850-341-7400. Zero three. So, Alex, first of all, thanks for being here. Of course. And you are originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, moved to Pensacola. What's the difference there? Tell us the difference. So, Cincinnati's really big. Pensacola, mm-hmm. comparatively, is small. Mm-hmm. I think Pensacola seems to think it's much smaller than it is, Mm -hmm. but in my experience, it is not mm. as small as some people would make it out to be. Part of the reason I was so excited to move here was the incredible arts community. Mm -hmm. Cincinnati is very large, and so there's this this very vibrant art scene. But to have what we have here in Pensacola is rare Mm -hmm. for a town of our size. Mm -hmm. And so it was just really, it was a compelling hey, something's going on here. We should investigate that a little bit. So mm. it's really great, and, and I love it. And you've been here how many years? It's not, not very long in this the grand is, scheme of this. This will be uh, five years. Yeah, wow. Okay. Five years. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about the what we have here to offer. Yeah. Um, I tell my wife all the time that what she doesn't understand because she went to a private school and I'm an instrumentalist, she's a singer, is that we have extremely well-developed music programs Mm -hmm. across public schools in Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa County. And even if you were to go to somewhere like Mobile, which seems more city-esque, the difference in skill level is pretty significant. Yeah, I would agree. I want to say that the difference here is that we have a really strong leadership within the public schools Mm -hmm. in terms of music programs, especially in Escambia County. To have, her name is Angela Barberry, she's the fine arts coordinator, to have a district-wide fine arts coordinator who is, that's their only job, Mm -hmm. they're not a teacher as well necessarily Mm -hmm. in the classroom, that's an asset that most districts across the country have gotten rid of, and we don't have that here, and I think that's a really big asset. I have to ask, being from Cincinnati, a Bengals fan or no? Not being in the sports? I mean... They're a the, football team. The Bengals are really difficult to like because they just screw up all the time. Yeah, they get really big and they like get to the really far and then they just really screw it up royally. Yeah, 
I'm pretty sure every championship game they've come into, they've been really cocky all the way through, and then they get to the third quarter or fourth quarter, and they just screw up everything. Yeah. No, not particularly. Yeah. It seems Stronger like a ho- Reds fan than mm. I am mm. a Bengals mm. fan, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Reds are a pretty good baseball team. I Definitely mean, a better baseball team than the Bengals are a football team. Yeah, Cincinnati sports is, is hard. It's, it's I mean, hard to be. True. It's hard to be a Cincinnati sports fan because yeah. they just really disappoint you all the time. I have family that lives in Ohio, so I've been there a few times around the Dayton area, and I honestly could never go back. I'm not trying to diss Ohio, but don't worry, my wife didn't believe me that it was a real place <laughs> for a while. So, Reagan, you ever been to Ohio? I have not. No, it's no on the way. list. No, I've been there. Though. Why? Why is it on your list? Unless you've only been to one of the three C cities, Cincinnati, Columbus, or Cleveland. The rest is pretty much corn. At some point, I want to make it to every main known city. Goodness, that's a lot. That I mean, lot. I want to retire at 50, maybe sooner. So there's a lot of time, 30 years or more, to just enjoy. You better hope your daughters, especially your youngest daughter, just like immediately goes to college and get an education and they never have to move back home with mom and dad. Oh, that's the <laughs> plan. <laughs> the plan that all you want. <laughs> there may be another global pandemic she can come or housing with. crash. She can come with. I don't care. Yeah. That's we'll, we'll get an RV or a fifth wheel and she'll there come with. There you go. Fifth wheel's big enough. I know. <laughs> I got a bunkhouse. All my kids fit in it. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So you talk about music. Uh-huh. What's your like music career, your history? We're all musicians here. My music career. So I started as a piano student, mm. and i that's where I fell in love with choir. I was a, well, what was anything? I sang in choir at church, and then I in high school I took choir and met my mentor, who has since passed, but he's my high school choir director. And he taught me how to play for choirs, so I was an accompanist. Mm. My senior year of high school I had four periods of choir. Wow. There were only seven periods in a day. I was also the only senior in freshman chorus and the only male in women's chorus because I refused to take any of those classes for no credit, even though I was just the accompanist for both. I was like, if I'm here, might as well enroll. Enroll. (laughs) Took the freshman exam as a senior in high school. Super fun. So when I went to my undergrad at the University of Cincinnati, I decided that if I was going to teach choir, I should learn how to sing officially. Mm. I took voice in high school, but I wasn't particularly grand. And so I had a really good teacher in college who was super patient with me because I was really stubborn and didn't like to practice like no one does. Yeah, I didn't practice (laughs) at all in college. Nope. And so I became a choir director and did most of my stuff in Cincinnati as a church choir director. And then I moved here. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember specifically being in college and my piano and teacher, I came in one day and like, I just riffed some like blues chords or something. And he was like, I don't understand. Like, we've never gone over that in this class. And yet you sit here and you could just play blues all day long, but you can't play the five scales I've given you. And I'm like, yeah, but this is way more fun. Like, I don't practice. Yeah, I'm the exact opposite because I didn't practice, but I also am very terrified of improvising. So I can't, like, I can improvise, but it's very conventional and very Mm -hmm. unoriginal. So I just let the more cool people do that than my, me. <laughs> my wife is the best sight reader I've ever met in my life. She's an impeccable sight reader. Yeah. Sight she can't re- improv at all. Sight reading is one of my skills as well. I can yeah. read anything on the page, but don't. if I don't have anything on the page, I'll clam up. Right. Speaking of music, speaking of choir music, from Cincinnati to Pensacola, to Pensacola Children's Course, what, how did that happen? What's the journey like? In my undergrad, we had to do internships our junior year, but I started my sophomore year because I was the overachiever, apparently. <laughs> and so there is a the Cincinnati Youth Choir <laughs> is based at the University of Cincinnati, and it's a pretty big group. They serve about 1,000 kids a year, pretty good national rec- reputation. And I started working there uh, as an accompanist, a paid accompanist. And then my junior year, I did a formal internship with one of the, the more elite ensembles. Mm-hmm. And then after graduating, there was an opening for the assistant director position, and they asked me to step into that role. Mm -hmm. So I did that right after my undergrad. And then I did that for, I did that job specifically for four years. So after six years, I had been doing children's choirs every Mm -hmm. week. And so I woke up one day and said, I think I'm good at children's choir, apparently, which (laughs) is not my career path that I was intending for myself at all. 
And then I started looking for jobs because I knew that my time in Cincinnati was coming to an end. And so this, honestly, Pensacola was the first job I learned about. And I applied. And a week later, I was already, they flew me down here for an interview. And the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. That is awesome. I, it's, it's an organization that I only have a relationship with because of Reagan. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> yeah. I, it's a cool place. Yeah. It's a yeah. cool place to be. I'm not trying to diss it at all. That's not my point. I just. Well, you no. just had no yeah. interaction with it prior. No. Prior. Yeah. And now you've interacted with. Many people. Many that have come yeah. from there. I'm sure there are things like that in it. I just wasn't. I was a percussion student. Like, I knew nothing of about it. And even coming down here, knew nothing of it. But on the flip side of that, we've had WGI people and drum corps people and stuff like that from that world. And maybe you would know a familiarity with that. But. And it's interesting because Cincinnati had 1,000 kids a year. Mm-hmm. Atlanta's a very big city, larger than Cincinnati. But Pensacola is not as large. And we see between 300 and 500 kids a year based wow. on our camps. And so... To see the size comparison between the cities, it, there's a big impact that mm-hmm. happens here locally, which I underestimated when I came because yep. I was like 300 singers a year, cool, ho oh, hum, not a big <laughs> deal compared to a thousand. But when you compare it to yeah. the population, that that's yeah. it's actually about one percent of the youth who are in this wow. area, which is wow. much different than any other large city. That definitely puts it into perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One percent is a sizable number. Yeah. Especially in a day and age where people talk about 2% a whole lot all the time. <laughs> they really downplay what that number, like when you talk about a population, if we're saying 300,000 people in Pensacola and surrounding areas, like 1% is a huge number. Mm-hmm. Of, yeah. And I realize we're talking about 1% of kids, but it's astronomical. But. Yeah. On the subject of music, we're here to talk about music today. Mm-hmm. World music specifically, right? Could you give us an explanation what that is and why you're a fan of it? Yeah, so... Or musics of the world. I may have worded that incorrectly. It doesn't matter. Okay. It's the same thing. Of course, it's a super nerdy thing to be like a music nerd and then be like a really big fan of kind of a niche Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thing of music. Like uh, my wife is really big into punk music and she considered herself a scene queen. Oh man. Oh yeah. You Uh know, hang out with (laughs) her. (laughs) Oh gosh. (laughs) She would. I was listening to dashboard confessional on the way here. So I I think we listened. That's one of the few. (laughs) He said music of the world. (laughs) Nah, I'll listen to dashboard confessional. (laughs) Get ready for this episode. Yeah. But so it's this weird intersection between who I am as a musician and who I am as a teacher, because part of the thing that really bothers me about the world nowadays is the lack of the lack of a child's opportunity to see something much bigger than themselves. I just think there's a disconnect nowadays between the importance of expanding your worldview beyond this little microcosm that we live in, yeah. Kauf, Pensacola. And I feel like that really has a bad impact on children and their development and their has, as they move into being adults. And so for me, the way that I intersected that as growing up was being exposed to, to world music. My teachers just showed me, gave me a musical experience that was so far different than my own upbringing mm. that it just it really opened my eyes to what the world is and and we just make a lot of assumptions about what the world is based on where we live and our lived experiences yes. and world music being something that was so innately I was in, able to relate in so many ways it just really opened my mind to how different people are and how even though we're different, there's so much that is the same that mm-hmm. we can relate to mm-hmm. with one another. So you're saying punk music is not popular everywhere. <laughs> I'm not going to vouch for the punk scene because my <laughs> wife would probably murder me if I tried. But so. pop, okay, pop music, popular music in America is not popular everywhere. You listen to like K-pop, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you listen to American pop and you Listen to what American country with I'm doing air quotes is yeah. nowadays. This very popularized. It's pop with an accent is what it, it is. Exactly. It just it has maybe some banjo in the background. <laughs> there, very there's little Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> there's identity in that. But then at the same time, when you look at it across the whole mm-hmm. thing, it, there's just not a lot of individuality in it. And I think we've lost a little bit of what makes that unique. And so the, I've never been a mainstream music person. I think the only thing that I could say that makes me unique is I liked the band Pompeii before they were mm. 
popular and and now I don't even know what they're doing anymore <laughs> so but that yeah I'm a niche person mm-hmm. but I, I also don't listen to music that much either because that's my job so I that's try fair. and be silent most of the time <laughs> I think what's interesting about this topic specifically is I think there's a comparison a little bit to you talk about worldview and I immediately go to it there is a problem I think when people fail to understand, just people in general fail to understand what worldview is. Yeah. And um, you talk about our kids today and it failing them. I think we've actually, we're already seeing it fail. Yes. And so even like within the church, we have an American worldview of the church and not really a global worldview of the church. And we're supposed to live out the Great Commission. And something like music or authors, reading literary sources from all over the world and really trying to put ourselves in the perspective of these people really starts to center this idea of a global worldview. And people get their hot button words, globalism and stuff like that all the time. But our mission is to realize that we are a people group and that we have differences and those differences are good we we can highlight those things but we're all to toge- we're all in this together we're all riding this rock through the stars and so understanding and appreciating i think art in general from different sources different cultural centers is such an important gift to help unite us yeah i right before we were recording this today i was working on a commission piece that i have to write and i to prepare for this, to prepare for writing any piece that I have to write, I have to, I listen to a lot of different things. And oftentimes I'll sit there at first listen and I'll be like, and I will compare what I'm hearing to what I'm capable of. Okay. These are better people than me. And so I listen to them and I compare it to myself. And there's a wall that I have to hit before I can start seeing, okay, it's not about me. I'm Mm -hmm. listening to this to grow as an individual, Mm. to expand my horizons, to expand my skills, to expand my compositional repertoire or whatever. And I feel like that's the wall that we hit as a society is that there's so much, we we talk about expanding our worldview or, or learning about people who are different than us. But oftentimes I feel like we do that from a me perspective. We do it through the lens of our own bias. Yeah, correct. And there's an extra step to that. It's not about evaluating someone else based on your view. It's about sitting there and and taking in what someone else's view is and accepting it as the reality. And it's not, it might not be yours, but that's okay. There's something Mm -hmm. to learn from that. And I think that's what's missing. Yeah. No, that's really good. I already really like this topic. Well, (laughs) yeah. And it's, that's a great way. It's a great way to look at it. And Especially because music is deep and music affects people. Music speaks to people almost in a spiritual way. You hear mm-hmm. that all the time growing mm-hmm. up, especially in music education. And so if you look at another world, their music, and think about their perspective, it's going to speak to them differently than it speaks to me. And so there's so much value in analyzing the music through their eyes as opposed to your own and how you connect with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And so it also gives you insight into that person's world more than probably a conversation through translation Mm. and Mm. through failed translation. You just listen to the same music and hear what they hear. You're going to learn so much about, about those people. Yeah, there's just so much to relate to with music. People... I mean, like you said, one of the things that people talk about with music, it's the universal language. And yes, it totally is the universal language, but I feel like sometimes that's a Mm cop-out of what music can do. And there's a deeper level to what music is. Music teaches so many values beyond just being able to listen to the same thing Mm -hmm. in the same room as different people than you are, you know. Every society who has music as part of their culture, which is literally every society, that music teaches discipline, that music teaches respect, that music teaches confidence, that music teaches social norms, that music celebrates, that music mourns. There is so much about the human experience that is defined by music that, at least in our country, I think we forget. Mm-hmm. Because so for us, it's so commercialized, it's mm. so popularized. There's very few instances in our American society where music plays a pivotal role at the forefront for music just to, to be there, to be something that is not there to make money, that's not there to showcase. It's there as part of our culture. It's very rare to find that here. I 
I want to ask a question to that point. Do you think that part of that is because of how relatively young we are as a nation that we don't have necessarily oh, yeah. inherent history hmm. uh, besides like Native American type of things? Do you think that plays a part into it? I think there's a little bit of that, you know, but there are some some inherently American genres of music. Yeah. Jazz was invented here. That's, that's a good point. And that was, but see, even jazz. It's as commercialized. Being, but even so, as an Americanized thing, that was, we didn't create that as Americans. That was an evolution of multiple musical cultures yep. that did not start here right. in the right. United States. It's a blending of so many different experiences, some that were glorified by the light of day and some that were the cause of slavery. It's There's so much dark and light that create what we have here. To your question, I yes, there's a bit of an issue with being so young, but also it's th this quote unquote melting pot. Mm -hmm. We just don't have a defined American sound. No. <laughs> and there's actually been composers who have tried to yeah. do that. I think um, Dvorak came and he lived in a little town. I, forgive me any music people who are like, you're wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was Dvorak. He lived in this little tiny town and either Iowa or Missouri and he was like I'm gonna write the American Symphony and I think that's what it's called the American oh, Symphony right. and we listened to it in music history class and all of us are like didn't sound American at all yeah. and of course it doesn't but because there is no what is yeah how can you but see that's also the beauty of it is we can't define it but at the same time it just I think it limit it's great but it also limits us because we don't have this definition of what American music is yeah, for sure and it will, and it definitely odes to, I think, bigger problems we have here in this country, lacking things that unite us. And, and that's a big one. That's such a good example of, not that your identity is found in music, but that you have cultures that have music that's tied to that culture that mm -hmm. has existed for so long mm -hmm. that there is at least a common ground that everyone in that society shares. Yeah. And we lack that in a lot of things here. Absolutely. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about musical nuance and teaching, I believe you can actually say that's the wrong approach, correct? So it's interesting because one of the, the, the big, especially in choral music, as music teachers, we're trying to, we take on the charge of, in many ways, trying to expose our students to the musics of the world. The problem is with the musics of the world, the non-Western music, and by non-Western, a non-Western European moved over across the seas, is that our systems of teaching are not authentic to the rest of the mm. world. We we're, we start on the page, the music that is written on the page, and we teach from the page, whereas most of the world, not, I don't want to say most of the world, I don't want to generalize, but a lot of the more authentic ways of teaching native music for whatever culture is by ear or by mm -hmm. rote. And then that goes even further in that our ears are attuned to a certain style of singing that when we hear something that violates our expectations, we see it as either wrong or different and not just is. Mm -hmm. And so that creates this othering of different styles of singing that has transcended in more ways than one. You can look at if you were a choir director and searched for world music, you would not find a lot of native composers writing native music because it's all been either taken by white male composers to arrange for Western choirs mm. or it's stuff that's being tokenized. And that's, it's difficult. Wow. Are there any regions specifically, any places of the world that you are more fond of musics that you're like, really you gravitate to? Yeah, part of my master's degree, I had to do a whole project on Eastern African music. Mm. And there's an issue of this generalization of Africa. One of the things that when I'm teaching any elementary kid and we're doing a piece that has any African influence or language, I'll ask them, I'll raise their hand. Africa is what? A country or a continent? <laughs> and half of them will say country and half of them will say continent. And I'm like, no, you're wrong. Let's fix this right now. <laughs> but I just, I have so much respect for East African music because the percussion, the rhythm of it is so complex. I mean, it just tells a really incredible story of who they are as a people and how they communicate with one another. And there's so much joy in the way that they sing and the way that they perform. It's a natural thing. When we do any African pieces at the Children's Chorus, we try really hard to do it as authentic as possible, which is really hard when we mirror 
music that's written on a page, and then we mm. create choreography, mm. which is just not how it is. I worked with a group in Cincinnati. It was the Nairobi Girls Choir from Kenya, and they tried to teach us, my church choir at the time, a high school that I brought them to, another high school, tried to teach them choreography or dancing. And it was just, to them, it was so natural. And, and to watch the kids try and imitate it, they, were like, they just kept saying, no, what are you doing? Why are you trying so hard? It was just, it was so, mm-hmm. the movement is so interconnected to the movement, or the, the movement is so interconnected to the singing and to the rhythm and to the drums. And it's just, and to the harmony, it it's something that's so missing for us. Everything we, we teach everything here separately mm-hmm. and then we attempt to move them together and it's hard to do that when so many other places can just do it so seamlessly. Like why do we have to try so hard? I mean, I imagine that is a cultural thing. We don't yeah. grow up doing that. That's no. so very from probably birth they see it, they experience it, they do it, and it's just a deep rooted part of their culture. And so yeah. then they're looking at someone who's never done it. And they're like, why don't you get it? And, and uh, to me, as a music teacher, I'm like, yeah. that's both a shame and like right. a failure on mm-hmm. my part because mm-hmm. it's okay. We should be able, I want my kids to be able to do that so naturally, but mm-hmm. can I do that naturally? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. So how could I teach them to do it naturally? And it's, yeah. it, it's a failure on our society of kind of othering the arts. Mm-hmm. Like the arts is a separate thing. It's something that can be cut. Mm. It's something mm. that can be underfunded. It's it's just not a priority necessarily. Well, it's just a very academic viewpoint of the right. arts. Yeah, it's a service that can be either brought in or eliminated at will. Yeah, and we started so late. A lot of people, you, Reagan, you talk about that funda- from their birth, birth. This is a fundamental part of their culture. And for us, it's an optional thing you do when you're a teenager. Yeah. And I, I think there probably are examples we talk about a traditional american sound i remember in college I, I met a guy who was a music major his family had a bluegrass band cool and didn't know anything about theory showing up to school sure. I mean, just total disadvantage but when you heard the five of them play unreal i mean incredible and like you hear that story all the time it would be these kids who come to music school or these kids who are not classically trained and they come to choir or they come to any music class and they're like i don't know anything of what's going on but i'm like a really proficient like guitarist Mm -hmm. and watch my band play and they're these incredible musicians Mm -hmm. and our education system has just put them in this box so they're not like, yeah, they may be talented, but they're not smart enough to right. be a musician. I'm like... But they're I, not classically trained. Well, I've got friends of mine, like very good friends who can yeah. tell me everybody has a moment where a music teacher in their life has told them they are not good enough mm-hmm. and they shouldn't sing. They shouldn't play. Like, you, you should go do something else. And everybody remembers that. Oh. Seniors, like not seniors in high school, like senior citizens can name that music teacher who told yeah. them that they were not good enough. I'm like, why yeah. is that a thing? Do you have any like familiarity with cross-cultural music or do you have anything that you specifically listen to? Nothing that I specifically listen to now. Mm. When you were in the children's course? But when I was in the children's <laughs> course, we did, there's a couple of different times where we would incorporate that into our spiritual music concert, which at the time was in Sacred Song and I believe is now music, One World, Many, One World Voices. Many Voices, which I believe is inspired out of this topic, I'm yes. assuming. Yes. And then also for Showtime, we did a couple of sets that were inspired by music of the world. Yeah, that's what I'll say. Okay. <laughs> there, there's a difference, I'll <laughs> say, um, between doing musics of the world and doing musics that are inspired mm. by the world. Mm-hmm. And we strive nowadays to ensure that we're not doing necessarily music we, we can do a music inspired by the world but also we need to do music of the mm-hmm. world there are really great composers out there who live in the united states who are really well versed in world music like they go out they've mm-hmm. gone to mm-hmm. these places and they've been influenced and that's actually i think that is okay when you go and you do the work and blend two cultures mm-hmm. that's fine that's actually american if, if mm-hmm. we're going to call it right. that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but there's also really important values of going and finding authentic music and teaching through that yeah you need that to, lens you need to do both mm-hmm. you can't just do yeah. one thing or the other yeah and I, I guess i should back up too in high school my choir teacher there valued it and we had a, a segment in one of our concerts that we did now, I don't know. Those arrangements probably were very Americanized, thinking back. But Well, uh, and until about 
10 years ago, that's all you would find here. Yeah. Right. Just because that's, that's what the movement, that's what it was. Right. And in, in college, I think we did one as well. And that was, that felt most authentic thing I've ever experienced. Couldn't tell you what it was now, but <laughs> I've definitely, I've been exposed to it. I've done it some, I have not spent a, a lot of time seeking it out. Yeah. But. I listen to a lot of, Japanese composers, mostly Japanese jazz, to be fair. There's a huge jazz movement in yes. Japan. And, and it started even back like in the 70s. But even to this day, there's a jazz pianist named Hiromi. If you guys are listening, check her out. She's incredible. And again, jazz, an American style of music, but it's totally different in Japan. Yes. And even though those things are inspired. Just and like Japanese whiskey is very different. <laughs> correct. <laughs> it, it's probably the thing I listen to the most, honestly. Hmm. But I didn't know that about you. Yeah, I listen I listen I almost exclusively listen to Japanese music like probably eighty to eighty five percent of the time. And then I listen to Japanese jazz it, probably thirty five to forty percent of that. Very cool. I wow. the other thing, being a percussionist and I was in a in a competitive light, which is the, the huge in this area is, is competitive drumming, being exposed, like I said, to Kana Call, like that is incredible like movement through time signatures and through rhythmic phrases and really studying how they maintain time and how they move through it is was such a useful thing for Mm. me like transitioning into college and really going from like a high school student into someone being capable of marching drum corps marching winter guard yeah it's such a different thing too because it's all it's sung and that it's clapped Mm -hmm. but if you can really learn to appreciate how they're moving through time signatures Man, as a percussionist, that's invaluable. So, Kana Call, for those who are not like oh, yeah. Yeah, familiar like, with it, like, it, it's, it's called the, the Takadimi method, yeah. if we're going to Americanize it. it. It's this, I think it's South Indian, just way of counting rhythms. And every beat has a different name. There's this great piece that we did my very first year. It's called Tatin Ta, and it's all conical. Mm. Uh, and it's all based on mm-hmm. the conical syllables. And every syllable that you sing is the yeah. syllable that you should. And it's just this really raw, free way of doing music. And it's just really neat. It's, it's super really neat. cool. There are a lot if you there are a lot of YouTube videos of you see them. And, and this is an American thing, I will. But you'll see a conical phrase, and then someone try to play it, like, on their hands. And it really it's a really good way for a person who's unfamiliar with that to see how complicated yes, it it's actually so is. So complicated. <laughs> yeah. Like I we did it for in, in in my undergrad for a little bit and then once it got too complicated I was like, hands up, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much. So let's uh, tell us about your first trip to Ireland and the story that goes along with it. Yeah, I went to Ireland. Actually, my first time was right before I moved here. It was like my last hurrah. One of my friends and I, we just decided we were going to go to Ireland and just kind of get a car and drive around everywhere. We had this, she and I did this undergrad class our freshman year where we had to do this immersion into Irish music, which we absolutely loathed because they forced us to do it. And it was a zero credit hour class. And Mm. we just were like, why are we doing this? It was like a waste of time. It was. It felt like a waste of time at the time. And so we had to buy, we'd buy all these supplies, all these, um, instruments we had to buy stuff for yes we had to buy stuff for a zero credit class i i still have three penny whistles which are just like rudimentary (laughs) just just, they're (laughs) i've never played them since but i still have them it's like i bought them that gum and i'm gonna keep them i know seriously through through the nine weeks that we were doing it it was it it grew on us a little bit more and it was still a pain in the butt and then of course several years later we went to ireland and we were like okay we're gonna go research the best places to listen to authentic irish music whatever that means what you what you can do in ireland is just walk into a a pub and you're gonna find authentic irish music no matter where you go and the thing that just really blows my mind and continues to blow my mind is that these musicians who sit down at every pub at every corner on every night of every day most likely have never played with each other their entire lives and and they sit down and they just have this repertoire of tunes in their minds and they're all playing different instruments yet they can all sit together five or six of them and just perform and it's insane to me like the closest thing we have here is jazz but even so they rehearse yeah it's not just yes you can sit down and there are musicians who can sit down for a jazz thing and play but still, for it, it's just, I, I'm not a jazz musician, so forgive me, any of you who are listening, but I just, I haven't, in my experience with jazz, 
being at a jazz school, I just don't see that as the same. You can't just do that here in America. And it, it was just so inspiring to me, and I, I don't get it to this day. It's, I'm in awe of the fact that these people just have this seemingly born and bred thing in them, and they can just sit down and make incredible music together. Like, I think it comes back to the cultural tie to it, though. Jazz does do this. When you're like, yeah, your of standards... Course. And there even is, our, our blues is a good example. If you're doing a traditional, like, one four five blues thing, yeah. and uh, you're going to do it in the key of E, every, let's go. You can, but it's, I do still think it lacks that cultural identity. There's a next step in, in Irish music yeah. is that it's not just the musicians who know the tunes. It's, it's everybody. Everybody, everybody knows yeah. the tunes. And it's, I can sit down and at a jazz club in New Orleans and I can appreciate it. And they, all the people on stage can know all the same tunes, but I've probably heard those for the first time in my life. And yeah, they'll play the standards, but they'll make up their own. They'll do newly, they'll do, do premieres, but everybody knows that over across the pond. And it's just yeah. so inspiring. It sounds awesome. Okay. You talk about Christopher 10. And how that helped you and that yeah. experience. You, you talk about, I think earlier you talked about silence because your job is music. Yeah. But Christopher Tin and his, his works hit you in a different way. Yeah. So Christopher Tin is a composer of all trades, if you could call him that. I mean, he's written for video games. He's written for orchestra. He writes for choir. And to be honest, I don't know too much about him other than he writes really well for a lot of different idioms. Even video games, yeah. So I came upon him because I just seem to like being a musician and someone who's really attuned to who likes world music. I always, when I hear world music influences and things, I'm like, I, my ear just perks up. And I don't find that a lot. And I just stumbled across some song by Christopher Tin. It was probably because he wrote a choral piece and I listened to it and I was like, wow, that's really cool. And so I looked him up and he's got these great symphonic albums that, just combine all different sorts of world music cultures be between songs. One will be something that is inspired by some East African drumming. Some will be this kind of Middle Eastern tonal set. Mm -hmm. Some will be he'll use traditional Chinese instruments. They're just cool mm -hmm. to listen to. Um, they're they're by no means like head boppers. <laughs> you're not gonna you know, you're not gonna find them at any party. I use that because they also have a really most of them have a really good beat. And, and there was a time in my life where I just needed to do a lot of running just to work out my emotions from stuff with my parents and stuff with my own personal life identity crisis. Mm -hmm. Not really midlife, but like pre midlife. <laughs> And so I did a lot of running and those songs just as someone who doesn't listen to music, I usually when I am running, I usually run in silence. But those really helped me mm. just find my footing in more ways than one. <laughs> What are some some critiques, some things that you think well, there's room for improvement, either both in world music or, or, or access to or? Okay, I can do both. Education of anything. Specific to world music, I'm going to, I'll speak specifically to the teaching side of it, but also to the consuming side of it. There, there's a way to use music to broaden your worldview that universe, music is a universal language. There's a way to just do that passively, but there's also a way to do that actively, mm -hmm. and that's seeking authentic artists who are in and of whatever culture you're looking for. I would encourage people to get out of the United States because regardless of even the non-white people who are making music, like you need to get beyond that. You need to go see what's happening in other countries because it's so different. It's so different. And you have to use, you have to, you just have to have a mindset of seeking knowledge from outside of your comfort zone. I feel like that's a big issue culture today for many reasons but mm. on the teaching side you know or on the access to music side I would say that especially those who are involved in our education system those parents who are responsible for giving their kids the education or giving them access to the education they want that they need to be they need to hold teachers accountable and teachers need to hold themselves accountable to ensuring that they are giving the students their students their kids the best possible opportunities they have to not only experience, but also take ownership of their own education to, to learn the skills and the tools that they need to understand that they are the champions of their own life. 
parents have a role, teachers have a role, but it's ultimately the kid that has mm-hmm. the responsibility to guide them throughout the rest of their life. And, and if we don't start that at an mm-hmm. early age, it's really hard to unlearn the opposite of that. We all are responsible for ourselves and, and the types of information that we consume and the type of information and, and persona and energy that we put out in the world. And that's, that's our collective responsibility. And with, with so much technology and the internet and... Yeah, I think in the past we may have had an excuse that America, as a North America as a continent, and the United States, like you, it's not easy to just cross co- country borders and go experience a different culture like it is in in Europe and in Asia and in Africa, mm, mm-hmm. right? You have to literally cross an ocean in, yeah. in many cases, and living in a certain region of the United States, like. You just you're not afforded the same luxuries to do that, you know, depending on your background and your income. And whereas in other continents, you can drive 20 minutes, drive an hour, drive two hours and it costs you nothing to do that and experience a different culture. But now, even still, with that being true, the Internet is a world of information and access to video and audio and all kinds of different experiences that you can at least just say, hey, watch this. This is what it's like across the ocean and and be doing that regularly. Um, I'm sure there are probably on iTunes and Spotify, there's access to authentic music. There is. I mean, there, there, and the internet is, is a wonderful tool, but it's also our greatest downfall. There, there are really incredible ways, but I'll, I'll never forget my second grade class where we were taught how to evaluate the authenticity of a source, oh, man. which I wish I'd, mm. I would imagine is not being taught anymore, <laughs> but yeah. I'll never forget that because mm. that's something I always do. No matter, every site that I go to that I'm looking for something, I look for certain things. Mm. There are ways to learn and there are ways to learn authentic, as close to authentic as possible. Right, and that's what I mean. It, yeah. it, it, we can get so much closer now than we used to yes. without having to cross the ocean. Correct. Um, whereas before, there was no access to it. Yeah. Uh, I think there's. Us. I do think there's an important asterisk I would make to that is only that if I'm encouraging a person to understand a culture through their music, that the goal is not enjoyment. The goal is understanding. Correct. Yes. And far too often all the time really we look at things through our enjoyment lens and not through the understanding lens Mm -hmm. which i would even argue you're not even fully enjoying unless you understand correct Uh, which may even be a pompous thing to say but you can say you like something but if you don't truly understand the intent behind it and we talked a little bit about this on when we talked about hip-hop and the history of Mm hip-hop how hip-hop has spread all across the internet thanks to TikTok and Reels and all right. that, these people doing dances and have zero, zero idea. Or the origin and the history. Correct. Come from. And so do you really like hip hop or do you just like followers on Instagram? Like what would you really, what's the enjoyment yeah. there? And I think the thing's true here for music as well. There's a great South African song called Ama Volo Volo. And it's, it's this really upbeat, there's great movement, it's really peppy and exciting. And unless you dig into it, you wouldn't know that was a, a song that helped people through apartheid. Mm. You wouldn't know that. Mm-hmm. So how can you enjoy that? Yeah, we can enjoy that through our lovely little happy, major, movement, fun lens. But if you really don't understand what that song meant in the context, how can you truly understand what right. that song means? It's just crazy. The last question we ask is, what's the future hold? What what does it access, education? What do you think the next five to ten years is like on this subject? Well, I would say that with all the, especially in the United States, what's been going on with the social movements and just a call for a lot more transparency and authenticity in just literally every aspect of life. We're already seeing that in the music world, especially in the education world. We're seeing people call upon white composers to step aside and allow for more authentic, more native composers share their own music. Now, the flip side of that is that we have to still overcome this barrier of all of this music is not taught in a printed Mm -hmm. music Mm -hmm. fashion. So we're not there yet. We have to figure out what the medium is. Right now, there's just not a good, there's not a good understanding amongst music educators of how to do that, especially in the United States. And I'm pretty sure elsewhere. There's just not a good medium yet on how we're going to bridge that gap of authenticity or as close to authentic as we can get. But it's coming. People are really committed to that. We're committed here and and there's 
there are people committed all across this country and the world who want to make that happen. I have, a, I have two questions, a question and a thought. Is there a organization, if you will, or alliance similar to similar to what we see in world world politics with different like NATO and different organizations that are why am I losing my mind right now? What's the one that the United States is a part of? The UN. The UN, yeah, United, United Nations. Nations. <laughs> wow. So simple. For music. Is there something like that for music where there's like countries and cultures that are like we come together and we focus on music education for each other together? There's a few things like that. Not for the general consumer, I would say. There's a bunch of music education groups. There's a bunch of choral groups, band groups, orchestra. Orchestra, I can say that word. I would say that in the United States, the, the group that does the most work on this specific front mm -hmm. of world music is the Smithsonian Institute. They mm -hmm. have this arm called Smithsonian Folkways, and they have, they're called ethnomusicologists, which is a really niche mm -hmm. field in musicology, which is the study of music history. And it's ethnomusicology is people who go out into the field such like the Western way of doing this. We're going to take yeah. us from our universities. We're going to go put them in these authentic cultures and we're going to study them. But anyway, it's this whole field that goes and collects these audio samples and audio songs, audio recordings of these different cultures. And they post most of them for free. And they're mm. really, it, it's a really cool way to just see, some, listen to something in, a, in the most authentic way that we can. That's probably the, the organization that's doing world music. The, if I could say the best way, mm -hmm. that's probably the best way. Right. Okay. But there's not like an organization designed around teaching each other how to do it. I would say there there are quite a bit of organizations. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the priority of any one mm. of them mm. okay. at this point. The other thing I, I think about is the medium of podcasting, right? Through the internet, we can literally call someone yeah. from another country, ask them about their culture and their music, and, and put it out there in an educational format for people who want to mm -hmm. be exposed to that mm -hmm. and hear it, hear them talk about it, hear them and see it through YouTube or their forms as well. So I wonder if there's something out there. If there's not, I, I would guess, imagine that there are already some podcasts out there about that. I give and someone free reign to do it if they're yeah. <laughs> go for it. Uh, I might try it in a couple of years, but <laughs> yeah. And I, th I think what's interesting about that is if you could find an expert from that area to almost teach a basic theory lesson. Yeah, like you have an hour, uh, exactly. Because even the way theory is, is going to be totally different from, from the way we do theory here in the Just West. And do if you're not Love part work. of the Western European society theory is literally not even a thing. Yeah. So the way, well, just the way you would teach it, you know, yeah. the way you would teach to it. The know, fundamental a two -year, sort of understanding. A two-year-old comes to you. That's the kind of brain I have when it comes to this style <laughs> Teach me music. music, yeah. So teach it to me. Yeah, so, of course, director of Pensacola Children's Chorus, what, uh, for those listeners out there who have no idea how to find you guys and go to a show and what is it that you just walk us through the basics, give us a little commercial sure. and how do we experience it? So the Pensacola Children's Chorus has been around for 32 years here in Pensacola. We serve about 300 singers across Northwest Florida in grades 1 through 12 across nine different resident ensembles who perform in 35 to 40 concerts a year. The three main ones happen downtown Pensacola at the Sanger Theater, Christmas on the Coast, One World, Many Voices, and Showtime. We have a great season coming up. We're, we made the COVID thing happen, and we were really successful in that, and we're really proud of our model, and we were able to keep kids singing from March 2020 through wow. today, so awesome. with no issues. Yeah. And we call that a, a really big accomplishment because that really does fulfill our mission mm -hmm. of making sure that our singers get the best education that they possibly can. And all the information on our program is online at PensacolaSings.org. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Hey there. If you're still listening... That means you really enjoy this podcast and don't like missing even a second of it. For that reason, I'm going to tell you how to hear even more. By that, I mean the raw, fully unedited, behind-the-scenes kind of stuff. Go to fantasticpeoplepod.supercast.tech and become a premium member of Fantastic People. The link will be in the show notes. Like I said, by doing that, you'll get the raw, completely unedited cut of every episode including much of our backlog. 
In addition, you'll get access to our Discord server, where we will host Ask Me Anythings and random fandom chats. But wait, there's more! You'll also get access to our upcoming recording schedule and the ability to submit questions for upcoming guests. Again, that's fantasticpeoplepod.supercast.tech.